Good morning. Camera on us now. I want to welcome everybody to the gathering. Uh, Happy New Year. We're in 2021. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. Uh, we're glad you're here with us this morning as we continue to gather uh, via live stream. And so I just want to welcome all of, all of you who call uh, the gathering your home and as well as family and friends uh, from a distance who join with us each Sunday. So we're glad that you are here this morning. Uh, please know that um, as we go forward in our morning that um, you can join us as we sing. Uh, the lyrics are on our um, homepage of our website. So if you go to thegatheringchurch.net, thegatheringchurch.net, um, just hit the song sheet tab. The lyrics to the songs we're going to sing this morning uh, will come up. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's start our morning together. Uh, as I say every Sunday, and we'll continue to say every Sunday, uh, we here at The Gathering, we really believe that following Jesus is the best way to live. And we're learning how to live and love like Jesus together. And our hope and dream and vision is that we would be able to be Jesus in our community, in the town of Patterson, that others might come to, to find the life that we have found in Jesus through us as we live. And so it's in that spirit that we actually gather on Sundays in this way. This is a chance for us to celebrate the life that we're living, to be challenged to grow into that life even more, to practice rhythms of, of life that, that we could experience throughout our week if we hold on to them as just practices, uh, the life rhythms of Jesus. And it also gives us a chance to be ministered to in our own heart. So my prayer this morning is that, that we would be li- able to live into the fullness of that. So uh, part of my New Year's thing is um, to get out on my bike and ride and do a longer ride. And um, because of the distance from a lot of my friends, I ended up riding on New Year's morning um, alone. But it was pretty cool just to have that alone time. And I, I rode my bike up Del Puerto Canyon. And uh, as I rode through there um, on New Year's Day morning, you know, if you ride way deep back in there, you notice the devastation from the fires that we experienced not that long ago. And the further you go in, I ride about 25 miles in before I turn around and come back. And the further you go in, the more burnt and damaged um, it is. And you can see it. I mean, it looks like a moonscape. But on New Year's Day, as I was riding through there, I started to see new life that's starting to come back. Um, And I could have taken a a multitude of pictures, but there was just so many uh, moments where I saw a a plant that had just grown up through the ashes, still surrounded by burnt ground and burnt trees and ashes. And yet here is this new green life. And I saw a couple of plants that were actually already beginning to try to flower. And it was just this reminder to me that um, as we've experienced 2020, um, we need to recognize that God is at work. And even in the midst of what seems like devastation, God is always up to something new. And he, he can bring new life out of ashes. So um, in my devotional time, as I read through the scriptures each year, Um, We get to the end of the year, and and it was Psalm 150, the last psalm. And let me read the words to you, because this is what I I read um, on New Year's Eve in the morning. And it was these words. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise his unequaled greatness. Praise him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with lyre and harp. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flutes. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with cloud-clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. You know, my, my heart wanted to do that, but at the same time, my heart is grieving because I know the struggle that's going on in our country, in our world right now, with the COVID virus, politics, division over so many different issues. It's like, okay, wait a minute. How, how can I do that at the end of the year? Give praise. And I was reminded um, this morning as I was reading in Isaiah these words. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, God's people, the one who formed you says, listen to these words, Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. When you go through deep waters, not if you go through deep waters, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. 
When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burnt up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So I think in the midst of rough times, we can celebrate, we can give praise, and we want to do that this morning as we sing. So so we're going to sing a few songs, and uh, let me pray, and uh, we will sing together. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you for reminders, even in nature, that you're always working. I want to thank you for the, the vision that out of ashes can come new life. And Lord, it does require that, that we recognize that even in the midst of the difficulties of this past year, you are always with us. You are always at work. You are always renewing, redeeming, and restoring. You are with those folks that are, are grieving and mourning over the loss of life. And not only the loss of life in terms of just someone passing away, but the loss of life as we've known it. It's looked a lot different. And yet, Lord, we can put our hope in you because you're always at work. So as we sing this morning, Lord, um, you desire that we would sing with every breath that we've got because our breath comes from you. And we can sing with confidence and boldness because we need not be afraid. We, not, we need not be a slave to those fears. Because yes, you, you are making all things new. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of knowing you and that you've chosen us to be the ones who are going to go out into the world each and every day and make things new. With the power of your Holy Spirit in us, as together we strive to live and love like your Son Jesus, our Savior. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. All the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. 
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your love flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me and I will dance and sing. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. 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 In the crushing, in the pressing, 
You are making new wine In the soil I now surrender You are breaking new ground So I yield to you and to your careful hand When I trust you I don't need to understand Make me your vessel Make me an offering Make me whatever you want me to be Came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you and to your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for this morning. We thank you for the reminder that that you can make things new. And Lord, we're calling out to you to do that. Lord, we're calling out to you to take all that is wrong, all that is wrong, all that is broken, all that is hurting, all the things that are not of you, and that you would make them new. Help us to yield our lives more to you. Help us to surrender our lives more to you so that you can do that in us and through us and around us. And we we can put our hope in that. We can put our hope in Jesus. We can put our hope in the Holy Spirit. We can put our hope in you. Our Lord, we do thank you for the way in which you provide for us. I thank you for the tithes and offerings that are presented into our community here each and every week. We thank you for your faithfulness through your people. Lord, we give back to you what you have so graciously blessed us with, that you might do greater things. So we thank you for offering this morning as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me change things up here a little bit. Well, it's great to be with you guys this morning. Guys and gals, I should say. We always use that term, guys, generically. Um, And again, I want to wish us um, a happy new year. Um, 2021 is here and it is ahead of us. And... um, I'm excited to see the miracles that God is going to do in, out of the midst of what we've been experiencing over the past year. A um, couple of announcements uh, before we get too far into this. One, if you're new, um, we do have new people a part of this community because we're on, on our live stream here. You can go to our website, the governing website, thegoveringchurch.net, and a big circle that says I'm new, and you can click on it. And if you give us a little bit of information, you can be included in our emails and our communications, and we'd love to have you um, be known um, as you um, choose to grow with us in in this way. Um, Secondly, um, in the coming year, I challenged us about this last week, and then I sent an email out and everything, um, and even did some stuff on Facebook and social media with it. But I want to encourage us to live into something, and that is having a shared devotional life together. And um, I use the Moravian um, readings that have been put together for hundreds of years, actually, And it takes you through the Bible in two years, and they have an app that you can pull up and add to your phone. It's really cheap, I think, 99 cents for the app, and um, I think they even updated it so the actual text of the year says 2021. But if you have that app, you can go on it every day, and it has readings for the day, it has a prayer for the day, it has scriptures to read. Um, You can go to the website, and you can get the email, and you just get an email if you're you're into that, Um, or you can... um, 
Uh, what's the other way? other way? Oh, you can actually buy the book. They have it on Amazon. You can get the Moravian text for, uh, for yourself just to read out of a book. And if any of you need help with that, let me know and I'll, I'll help you get a book. But I really believe if we were to have a shared devotion life where we're all reading the same scriptures every day, it's going to do something to us as a community um, as we read and pray over the same things together um, as one. Um, Next is, we have an annual partners meeting. So for you that are old school, uh, you probably would use the word membership. But we're, we're looking at a ministry together as a family, as a partnership that we have with one another. So if you consider the gathering, your church, I want to invite you um, on Sunday, September, or January. Wow, losing all kinds of words here. You know, it's really funny. I don't know if you've already done this already, but I've been writing 2020 on things that I need to write 2021 on brain's a little confused. So Sunday, January 24th, um, at 11.30, we're going to have a Zoom uh, partners meeting. And uh, we'll go over some things that are um, reflections from the past year where God has been so good. But we're also going to cast some vision for the coming year in terms of what we see that God is doing. We want to update you on some improvements that are going on in our facility, where the money's coming from. And then we do need to uh, approve our budget for this year and so we need all of our partners in ministry. And so would love to have you just join us on that Zoom. And then, I know there was one more thing. One more thing. Peter's a little distracted this morning. We had technology issues this morning, so I'm a little distracted. Apologize for that. Oh, yeah, growth groups. So, um, again, I challenged this last week in terms of that, about uh, being in a group together with others that are striving to grow more into the image of Jesus. And the way we do that here is what we call G2s, or growth groups. And we're going to have a webinar on Wednesday, this week, from 7 to 8. And, and here's my challenge to us. If you've been in a growth group, or you'd like to be in a growth group, or you'd like to lead a growth group, this is a chance for us to be together to, to revisit the format that we follow. It's a chance to recalibrate, just to get back on the same page with it. And then we're going to kick those off again um, in the second week of January. And I want to encourage all of us to step into the waters on that. It's, it's, it's valuable in terms of growing deeper relationships with the people you're in a group with. But then you're going to be in a group that's actually asking the questions we ask all the time around here. And there's some accountability that goes with that in a wonderful way, and it will help you grow. Um, so those are my announcements for this morning. So we're in this series called Waymakers. And we've been going through the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, the letter that Paul wrote to this young, diverse church. And we're going to be in Ephesians 6 today, this morning. Um, and if you have a Bible, you can get that out. If you have a Bible app, you can pull it up. I am going to go back a little bit into chapter 5, so just have, have that in mind. So uh, one of the things that I saw a lot on social media, and I, and I heard a lot of people just on TV and stuff saying this, is like, I cannot wait till 2020 is over. It has been, it has been a year I, I just want to put behind me. I don't want to remember it. I want it out of here. You know, let's live into 2021. And I think it's real easy to, to say, you know what, I don't want to look back here because it was icky, and I want to look forward to what I'm hoping is going to be good. But I think, I think we actually miss something if we don't do that. Um, many of you know my mom and dad are both in memory care and are struggling um, with dementia. And you know what's being lost in their, their struggle with dementia is my family story, my family story. You know, one of the greatest gifts that my mom um, gave all of us, my mom loves to write, um, she wrote this. And I remember when she was writing it, all of us kids and everything, we thought, what's mom doing? You know, she's making a book about our life and, and she's going to expect us to all have a copy of it and everything. And I'll tell you what, now this book is so valuable. The title of it is Tasting Life Twice. And my mom went through and wrote stories about family members, um, about Betsy and I, my kids, my brother and sister growing up, my grandparents. I mean, it's all in here. Pets we had, there's stories in here. And now this is incredibly valuable to me because I can't call my mom and dad on the phone and get the story from them. It's, it's gone from them, but it's here in writing. And this is a huge, huge gift. So I was talking to my brother yesterday, and I was trying to find the name of somebody. I was trying to find the name of somebody, somebody in my dad's life. 
um, that had a huge impact on him in, in a way that would seem insignificant, but it was very, very significant. Uh, my dad grew up and he was the only child and in that family dynamic with my grandma and grandpa, I don't know if my dad was planned or it was just a gift from God to them, um, but my grandma and grandpa, my dad's mom and dad, they like to enjoy life and everything, um, but, but my grandma, I don't think it was her goal in life to be a mom. And so as she raised my dad, it was a struggle for her. I mean, it wasn't something that, that meshed well with who she was. She wasn't used to living that way. And so my dad, in a lot of ways, I don't want to say he grew up in a dysfunctional home, because he didn't, but it was, there was just a lot of stuff missing, you know, that you would want a young boy to experience. And so there was this lady down the street, and um, my mom thinks her name was Mrs. Walters. I talked to my mom yesterday, and I don't know if that was the actual name, but um, there was this lady down the street who will, will just say, I don't know her name. And my grandma was a terrible cook. I mean, a terrible cook. She knew how to cook, cook a couple things. And you, if you experienced her, that's all you ever ate. So imagine being my dad growing up and being faced with breakfast every morning. It was just not a pleasant moment. So my dad, on the way to school, there was this lady down the street who was familiar with my dad, familiar with the family. And on my dad's way to school, he would invite, she would invite him in to have breakfast, and she was a good cook. And so my dad got to have this moment with this woman down the street. Many mornings on the way to school, someone who loved to cook was cooking him breakfast, but there was conversations that took place. Um, my grandma didn't, didn't really value um, reading and all those kinds of things. And so when my dad was reading books, she would tell him not to do that and go do something else, those kinds of things. But this lady would say, so Bill, what books are, have you been reading? And would talk with him. And there was just all of this dialogue that took place. I don't know if this woman was a believer or not, but when I hear the little bits and pieces that I've received, this woman, there was light in her. There was a lot of Jesus in her. And those seeds were planted in my dad's life. My grandma and grandpa were not believers. But these seeds were planted. And then when my dad met my mom, who was a believer, and went to church with my mom and was in a great place, he connected the dots. He came to know Christ because he recognized that light over here that he'd seen in somebody else and he recognized it in those before him and then he made choices that impacted my life. I wouldn't be here today. I grew up in a home that was completely different than what my dad grew up in. I believe more and more as I get older and I'm having to be reminded of this constantly and I need to relearn, relearn this, is we should never underestimate the power of Jesus in our life, through our life, in the life of, life of others as we imitate him. We need to realize that as we follow Jesus and just live out what that life looks like, we are planting seeds. We're bringing light into other people's lives that might be dark. And as people experience us, they get pointed to the Jesus that we know. I keep saying over and over in um, this series that as you and I are united in spirit and purpose and growing more and more like Jesus together, we end up being a people that God uses to draw people to himself. God is drawing people to himself all of the time. And it's in that, being around us as we live our lives, that they come to know the Jesus that we know and will choose to follow. So we're going to dive into Ephesians today. And you'll see how this connects a little bit. Um, chapter 5. So let me get there. Let me give us a little background on this so that we, we get the weight of the context. Because we can read words like this and we, we just apply it to what our life experience has been. Um, so let, let's go back. So if you were a kid at the time of this young church in Ephesus, in Rome, if you were a kid and you were born, this is what happened. You were born... And the mom would take the child and lay it at the father's feet. And the father would make a decision. One, to keep it or not. One, to sell that child into slavery. Or, the worst of the worst, to take that child and sacrifice it to a god of the world. Okay? So children weren't so valued and it was that father's decision in that moment whether to keep it 
or to experience the other two. So as Paul writes these words that we're going to read this morning, you need to know then that these words have huge impact. If you were a slave at the time this was written, um, you had been captured, you weren't even considered human, um, you were treated poorly, uh, you weren't given any of the advantages, and there was no way out if you were a slave. And so because of that, to be a slave was to not be human, to not be human. Okay, so as I read this passage um, this morning, just keep that, keep that in mind. So I'm going to go back to what we read last week. Verse 31. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And this is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way of Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents, because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on this earth. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord, that comes from Jesus. Slaves, Obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time and not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all of your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do whether we are slaves or free. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Um, I thank you for the gift of your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would um, open up our hearts, clear our minds, that we might hear what you have for us personally today. And Lord, I pray that what I share is um, helpful, truthful, and pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. So Paul, as he's been encouraging us, encouraging this church, but encouraging us too, um, he's been challenging us along the way here in this idea of be, being united in spirit and purpose, together growing more and more into the image of Jesus. That's, that's the message from this letter to this young church. Over the past few weeks, we've been reminded, don't live like non-believers. Imitate the life of Jesus. We've been reminded, live as people of the light. Let your lives speak. Let your lives speak. Not your words. Let your lives speak. Live lives that are pleasing to Jesus. Make the most of every opportunity that you're given. And then last week, submit your lives to one another. That hard word. That we can submit our lives to one another. We are able to do that when we're all seeking after the same thing. If we're all seeking to imitate and please Jesus, then it's real easy to submit our lives to one another. And then Paul, at the end here, I talked about mystery last week, but do you realize the mystery that he's talking about is this idea that two become one. That two become one. A husband and wife, when they get married, they're not two individuals anymore. They are one. And then, G, then Paul writes that in the same way in the church, as we are all in relationship together, following Jesus, we are one with him. We're not a bunch of individuals. We are one with him. And I love how Paul still gives us our uniqueness and our part in that. He says that we're one as each of us does our part, which means he's created us all uniquely to bring something into that, that mysterious relationship of being one. And I really believe as you and I live, the key to having healthy relational lives, not only in marriage, is this idea of grace. And I've always defined grace as this for me. It's being reminded that, that God is doing a divine work in each one of us. As God is always at work and he's drawing people to himself, he's drawing people to himself so that he can renew, redeem, and restore and transform them. And Jesus was all about that. Jesus was the embodiment of this idea of grace in the flesh. He didn't look at anybody different than he looked at anybody else. And as we imitate his life, we become the embodiment of that grace and really, to embody that, it means we have to learn how to live an other-centered life. So this grace has sacrifice involved in it. 
And in order for us to have really healthy relationships in our marriage, it requires that there's sacrificial grace, that we recognize that we are one. Um, And our relationships with anybody, especially within the, the church itself, we have to recognize there's sacrificial grace in those relationships as well. We are one people, one people. And so to look at anybody differently than you look at yourself, that's not living this life of sacrificial grace. Last week, that idea of submitting to one another out of reverence for Jesus is because Jesus did that. He sacrificed, he sacrificed who he was in order to be able to extend grace to all people. Think about that. He sacrificed who he was as the Son of God, sacrificed who he was so that he could extend that grace to everyone. No exceptions, no exceptions. So as I read, read this passage this week, the phrase that stood out to me was, as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Which means everything that we do, we ought to stop and reflect, look back, look forward, and say, am I doing this as if I was doing this to Jesus? I think it's a great guide for us as we try to imitate and please Jesus with our lives. Jesus said these profound words to the disciples following him. He said, whatever you have done to the least of, and he rattled on a long list, whatever you've done to the least of, the people that are looked down upon, the people that are less, which is crazy to think about. Jesus said, whatever you did to them, you did to me. You've done to me. The way you treat others, you need to look at them as if they are me. How would you treat me? The Apostle Paul writes these words, and if you get any emails from me personally, you'll notice at the bottom I have these words. Paul was really compelled by the love of Christ. He writes these words, for Christ's love compels me. And what that means is I need to look at the life of Jesus and as I live my life every day, I'm compelled by the way that Jesus looked at others with this idea of sacrificial grace and he was willing to treat all people as if they were the same. So here we have these two other human relationships that we have. We talked about marriage last week specifically, but today we're talking about kids and really what we're talking about is the workplace. And, and he gives these, these words, he says... Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. It's the right thing to do. And if you honor your mom and dad, good things are going to come from it. And at the same time, he challenges the father. Notice it doesn't say fathers and mothers, which shows you a whole other conversation. Don't provoke your children to anger. These words were heavy. Because for one, what Paul's saying is kids are valuable. So kids, even though you've grown up in this culture that doesn't value you, In this community of followers of Jesus, you're going to be valued. So since you're going to be valued, you need to obey your parents. You need to honor and respect them. Knowing that they're trying to live into the ways of Jesus and the same ways of Jesus that you're being taught. And then fathers, you know, if you're tempted to go back into the old ways of your culture, don't do it. Raise them in such a way that you're actually looking to Jesus, the person you're trying to follow, the person you're trying to imitate. And raise them in the ways of Jesus. In other words, treat your kids the way Jesus would treat them. Do that. Bring them up in the ways of the Lord. Ask the Lord for help when you're in those moments. Don't rely on your own stuff, but ask for the Lord's help as you have to guide and raise your kids. You know, one of the things that's interesting about my father, and I watched this um, later in life because I get to have a relationship with his mom, my grandma. Man, my dad respected her. He honored her. He had her at every holiday thing, brought her to sporting events and all this kind of stuff. And that my dad didn't talk much about his life growing up in that home. So I don't know a whole lot of the story. And you have to say to yourself, why why aren't we talking about dad's life story? Which meant my dad extended sacrificial grace to his mom and dad as a follower of Jesus, as an adult. And he honored them by bringing them into my brother and sisters in my life. Why? Because he was like, Lord, how how should I honor my mom in the midst of whatever's missing, whatever, maybe I wasn't treated that way, and he honored her till the day that she passed away. This idea of sacrificial grace needs to show up in our workplace. It needs to show up in our workplace. Paul says, whether you're slave or free, So um, I was thinking about this. I think some of us are really fortunate that we have jobs. We go to a place to work. 
that we actually love doing. It, it fits who we are. It fits uh, the way we're wired. It's our passion. So what we go do every day doesn't seem like work. But then there's some of us, to be honest, and I, I, I'm fortunate to be one of those ones that I don't feel like I work. Um, but um, there's others that you literally go in and you punch the clock. And it's a job and it's providing for you. It's not your passion. In fact, most of your passion, you live outside of that place. Um, but you sort of feel like, you know, I, I'm sort of a, a, a slave in the sense that I wouldn't choose to do this, but God is providing me out of that job in such a way. But this idea of sacrificial grace needs to show up in that place uh, where we work, where we work. Paul is saying it doesn't matter whether you're slave or you're free. You need to be followers of Jesus in the context of that in terms of being just an employee, uh, being an owner, being a boss, or being a supervisor. And he points out some very specific things in this passage. Obedience with great respect, which means as you're working alongside people, as you're working under people, if, if you're going to live into the ways of Jesus, Paul is saying you need to be obedient and honor them with great respect, even when they don't treat you that way. You need to work to please them at all times. And I'm not talking about being a people pleaser. What they ask of you, you put your best into it so that you can live up to their expectation of what your job is, that they're pleased with you. You need to work with enthusiasm. And there's a lot of people who work around us who don't work very enthusiastically. You need to work with enthusiasm. And it says, Paul writes, that there is a great reward for those of us that do that. Do that intangible thing that maybe a boss is looking at all of his employees and he's like, going, there's something different about that one. That one. So we're living into that idea is doing everything as if we were doing that for Jesus. So you can look at your employer that way. You can look at your colleagues that way. Treat them as if they were Jesus among you. So I've been reading this book called um, A Patient Ferment. And it's about the early history of the church. And it's written about a church like Ephesus in the midst of Roman culture. And you need to know in the year 240, they had a plague. So we're having a pandemic. They had a plague. And you know what was happening in the life of, of that culture was exactly what I see kind of happening in our culture today. People were dying left and right. And the plague didn't distinguish between who you were. It didn't matter who you were. Christian, non-Christian, you know, lifestyle, it didn't, rich, poor, it didn't matter. People were dying of the plague. And so people in the Roman culture were literally doing the same thing. They were arguing amongst themselves because they had all of these different gods they worshipped. And they're like going, which god did we tick off that's putting this plague on us? And then they were even looking at their political leaders and going, how are you going to fix this? How do we have to appease the gods so we can get our lives back? The Christians were just doing life together in community living into the practices of Jesus, living into the ways of Jesus 24-7. 24-7. And their response during this plague was to go out and not only take care of those among them who were followers of Jesus, but to go out and care for everyone. And they didn't say anything, they just went out and did it. And it's interesting, it's interesting and there's a lot of history on this, that that people who weren't believers recognized that the Christians were out there and they were the ones that were helping people and putting their lives at great risk in order to care for those that were sick and were dying. This early church back then, this is how they operated. They lived like Jesus 24-7. They practiced the life rhythms of following Jesus. And we can read about those in Scripture in terms of the early church. They just lived it. They didn't have a goal to go out in the world and tell people about it. They just lived it. And the world noticed it. It was a contrary life to what they were experiencing. And so when people saw their lives and saw that it offered something different than the culture, it was compelling to them. It was light in the darkness. And they would ask, why is it that you live this way? Why is it? So just take marriage, for example. They were valuing marriage, being married to one woman. And they would get encountered in culture and they would go, wait, you've got one wife and you, you have like this relationship and everything? You know, a woman might look at that and go, well, I don't have that relationship with my husband and our culture doesn't even, wait, you have this kind of relationship? What, what does that come from? And they would just say, we value our relationship, we value our marriage because that's what we've learned from Jesus. 
They'd, they'd see them treating their kids differently than the culture did. They, they actually kept their children. They raised them. They valued them. And the culture would ask, the people would ask, wait a minute, you, you seem to love your kids and have a relationship with them, both mom and dad. What, what's going on with that? And their response would be, well, we love our kids. We value them. They're a gift from God. And we treat them this way because we've learned that from Jesus. Jesus has taught us how to do that. They all had to go out and work in the community. Some were slaves. Um, some were employees that were being treated badly, and yet they would do it with enthusiasm. They would please their employers. They, they didn't fight back. Can you imagine the masters like going, wait a minute, you, you're not acting like everybody else does. Why, why don't you fight back? Why don't you push back? Why don't, you do this with a smile on your face, even when I give you the worst thing to do. And they go, well, I've learned that because that's what I've learned from the ways, I'm a Jesus follower and that's the way Jesus teaches and so I live that way. You need to know that that's how the church grew. That's how the church grew. It was so contrary to culture that people weren't experiencing it here and they wanted to share in that experience and the, so they sought it out. They were compelled. It was light in the midst of their darkness. So let me end with this. Many of us are married. Some of us are contemplating getting married way down the road, maybe. If you want an amazing marriage, look to Jesus. Have Jesus at the center of your life. Imitate his life. And if you get to marry someone, which I encourage you to do, who is also a follower of Jesus, you are going to have an amazing marriage. And people are going to see it. If we want to be an amazing church, where the world looks and goes, wait a minute, there's something different about these people. We have to have Christ at the center. We have to have Christ at the center. We all need to follow Jesus and we need to do it together. If we want to be an amazing church, that's what it looks like. It's not just attending church on Sunday. It's not just doing religious things that look like Christians. It's literally being Jesus in our daily lives, but doing that together. If you want to be amazing parents, you're contemplating having kids, you have kids, you're struggling with kids right now. If you want to change that dynamic, you need to look to Jesus and say, Jesus, how do you want me to raise my kids? How do you want me to love my kids? How do you want me to handle this season right now where they're driving me crazy? You need to put Jesus at the center. If you want to see God at work in your workplace, you need to put Jesus in the center of it. You need to put Jesus in the center of it. When I was a school teacher, I taught in a bunch of different schools. I wasn't in the same one. I was blessed to be in one for a long time. But then I taught at some other schools and the dynamics weren't always the best. It was very, very challenging. And the only way I got through it was I had to look at all of my colleagues through the lens of Jesus, the way he looked at them. I had to look at the other teachers. I had to look at the challenging students. And what was amazing was God did incredible work in those moments. Why? Because I kept Jesus at the center. That's how we become light in the dark world that we live in. Our lives will be brightly shining in such a way that others are going to be compelled to seek the life that we have found in Jesus. I got an email from our denomination as the end of the year and an encouragement into the new year, and I love the Evangelical Covenant Church. And you can attach whatever you want to all of those words. I'll tell you what, our denomination values relationship with one another. They value relationship with one another. And this, these were the words, and they're, they're covenant words, if you're not familiar with the Evangelical Covenant Church, said these words, in reflection back and looking forward. Together, we care for one another. Together, we serve one another. Together, we carry hope. And these are our big words. We are better together. We are better together. So my prayer for us today is that our lives together as we grow and try to, to be better followers of Jesus and serve our community here in Patterson in very tangible ways in the coming year, um, I'm praying that, that that will have an impact in our town. Um, we are the way makers. God works through us. Jesus works through us. The Holy Spirit works through us. And people need um, a light in the darkness right now. There's a lot of people struggling and living in these troubled times. And we are the people that will be able to bring them hope as we live and navigate through that. So that's what I had to share this morning. 
as I always ask each and every week, I want you to take a moment and reflect. Um, what did you hear? What was God saying to you? The Holy Spirit speaks to us. And um, he may have spoken something specifically to you. And the second question is to ask yourself, what am I supposed to do with what I heard? What am I so supposed to do with what I heard? So I'll give you a little awkward silence to reflect for a moment. And then we'll sing one more song on our way out. Sunday, we've been ending this song. I, I really believe that the lyrics keep speaking anew each and every Sunday as we reflect on what we've heard. It's a great reminder of all that God has done, is doing, and will continue to do. But it's also a reminder to us God uses us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world. So it's a song of hope, a song of reminder that we're ho- what we're hoping and looking for, it's going to happen through us. We can pray, and we can seek, and we can ask God to act on our behalf. And I believe he can do that. But ultimately, he wants to do it through us. He's chosen us. We're his kids. We reflect him. We're the ones that are going to make a difference in our world. So may this uh, song be a reminder of who God is, and even more so, who we're supposed to be. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in this place, I worship you, I worship you. Let's sing that again. You are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here. Moving in this place, I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise 
deeper light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. Touching every life, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, meeting every need. I worship you. I worship you. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. My God, that is who you are. My God, that is who you are. My God, that is who we are. That is who we are. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, I do pray a special blessing on each one of us this week. I pray, Lord, um, that you would continue to watch over, guard, and protect, provide everything that we need. And Lord, as we live our lives this week, may we look for opportunities to be Jesus in the lives of others, that our lives might bring light into the darkness, that our light might bring hope, that our lives might bring joy, that our lives would make a difference, so much so that it would compel others to seek after the life um, that we have found in Jesus. And help us to do that together. pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So um, just uh, an ending thought. Um, our food pantry, um, which we have here, which continues to meet huge needs in our community, um, God is continuing to add other opportunities um, for people to be helped. And so um, I just want to share two with you that have happened. And again, this is God doing this through people. This isn't us thinking of new things we can do. Um, another church here in town, a Pastor Caesar's church, where many of you know Pastor Caesar, um, they've been really praying and seeking after what God might do um, through them to meet needs here in our town. We have a lot of families in our community here, um, some are known and some aren't known, that are struggling with uh, covid they either have the illness in their home or they have someone who's in the hospital struggling with it or they may have lost a family member to it. Um, so Pastor Caesar is putting together a team of people that includes nurses and they're going to provide care packages with necessary items that can help in journeying through COVID in the home. Um, they also want to be able to pray for people and um, support them, which might even include us bringing food. And so if you would like to be a part of that, you can just let me know. And then secondly, we sponsored families at um, Christmas time who we knew weren't going to be able to navigate through Christmas with, with limited resources and finances. And as we go through the year, you need to know that just sponsoring a family at Christmas has that moment. But there's other things like that that families might not be able to celebrate. So we're going to open it up that if you would like to sponsor a family during this uh, COVID season that we are in, um, you can choose to sponsor a family. We're going to find out families that need some help. And what that could look like is imagine a family that has three kids or four kids and birthdays are coming up and, and they want to celebrate that child's birthday, but their resources are so limited, you could help them with that. So we want to connect families with families um, as we did at Christmas, but we don't want it to just be a Christmas thing. We want it to be something that we will do during this crisis that we're in. It's a chance for you to be a blessing into the life of someone who's struggling. So those are two options. Just let me know. Hit me up. Message me on Facebook, text me, email me, whatever, and we'll start to make those connections. So anyway, that's what I have today.
So um, have a great afternoon. And um, I think the 49ers, we got our last game. Our last game. It's going to be a good one. Go Niners. See you soon.